Hi, I'm Michelle Zuby, a board certified behavior analyst at Brett Denovi & Associates. Today I'm going to review a brief tutorial on acceptance and commitment therapy as seen through the lens of derived stimulus relations, an article by Sierra McEntecart from 2018. This pertains to task list items Z9, G5, J14, and FK42. Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, otherwise known as ACT, is a behavior therapy that more and more BCBAs are beginning to incorporate into their practice. Like any new wave of science and intervention, it takes time to gain traction within the field and for clinicians to adopt and adapt to different methodology. BCBAs often question the behavioral tenets of ACT, and for that reason, I'm going to break down Sierra McEntecart's 2018 article from Perspectives on Behavioral Science a brief tutorial on acceptance and commitment therapy as seen through the lens of derived stimulus relations. To begin, ACT has a body of research containing over 200 randomized controlled trials. ACT is associated with a behavior analytic account of human language and cognition known as relational frame theory, or RFT. RFT is built upon the concept of derived stimulus relations. The basic idea behind both RFT and ACT is that the evolution of human language, conceptualized as derived relational responding, creates a type of psychological suffering that is largely unique to humans. It may be better to conceptualize that RFT is the theory while ACT is the clinical intervention designed to deal with the psychological problems that human language creates for our species. McKenzie-Cart points out that while ACT was not born out of RFT, the two are interrelated. RFT offers a functional analytic approach to how socially significant behaviors can be understood and manipulated. McKenzie-Cart makes special mention that the study between derived relations, RFT, and ACT evolved out of the need for a model to train clinicians and to bring forth a way to bring ACT to people not well versed in behavior analysis. From this model, the psychological flexibility model known as the ACT Hexaflex was conceived. According to Barnes, Holmes, and colleagues 2016, the model provides benefits to clinicians, but it may have convoluted the relationship between ACT and RFT. McKenzie Hart details in this article how the connections between RFT and ACT have remained intact and suggests that it may be possible to further refine these connections with new conceptual developments in RFT. Let's begin with the conceptual background of ACT and its early connections to derived stimulus relations. Behavior analysts were the first to change socially significant behaviors specifically by using functional assessments to identify conceptual variables that exert stimulus and consequential control over target behaviors. Thus, the contextual variables could be used to elicit a change in behavior. With the behavior modification movement, these variables were looked at less contextually and the role of consequences to change behavior took precedence over functional assessment. The author notes that both the importance and the use of functional assessment resurfaced when researchers returned to a more contextual approach to challenging behaviors. The focus of this resurgence had a heavy emphasis on the domain of developmental disabilities. The behavior analytic research using functional assessment to evaluate the complexity of verbal behavior has remained limited. Cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, emerged as a way to deal with the verbal complexity by mediating cognitive or mental events. CBT purports that cognitions control actions, which in turn are the cause of, for emotional and behavioral challenges. While this view supports the role of language in private events as an aspect of human suffering, there is a heavy emphasis on mentalistic processes with little to no focus on the external environment. Conversely, ACT offered a behavior analytic account to talk therapy that was both contextually and behaviorally based. ACT suggested that instructional control or rule-governed behavior was the cause of human suffering and offered a method for dealing with excessive rule following that teaches clients the ability to observe or step back from thoughts and feelings. As Zettel 2016 noted, from a behavior analytic perspective, clients were taught to observe or simply notice problematic rules that had been used to guide behavior and to engage more directly with the contingencies of reinforcement in the natural environment. According to Hayes, 1989, in the early stages of ACT, it relied heavily on the concept of rule-governed behavior at a time when this type of behavior was attracting considerable attention in the science of behavior analysis. At this point, there was no precise functional analytic definition of instructional control or rule-governed behavior. Skinner postured that rules specify reinforcement contingencies, however, specification had not clearly been defined. In 1971, Sidman offered a functional analytic definition of specification through his work on stimulus equivalence. 
Sidman suggested equivalence relations were defined by the emergence of matching behaviors that could not be explained by direct reinforcement contingencies or other well-established behavioral principles. He said that the formation of such equivalence relations may provide a behavior analytic interpretation of semantic meaning in human language. His work may have indirectly captured the meaning of specification the field was looking for. Sidman's equivalence relations may be considered the most basic type of symbolic relation. However, Hayes and colleagues countered that equivalence responding may be interpreted as a type of generalized operant behavior, and these operands could be identified within human language as relational frames. Hughes and Barnes-Holmes, 2016, used the example that children not only learn to relate arbitrary stimuli as participating in equivalence relations, but also acquired other relational operands such as coordination, opposition, distinction, comparison, spatial frames, temporal frames, didactic relations, and hierarchical relations. Relational frames as a generalized relational operand seem to provide a functional analytic way of defining and studying rule-governed behavior. McKenzie gives the example of the rule, when the green light comes on, then go. This involves a series of derived equivalence relations between each word in the rule and the event to which it refers, with specific words in the rules such as when and then functioning as contextual cues for temporal relations. In this case, the rule specifies green light first, go second. In an effort to conceptualize how rules specify contingencies, RFC relies on derived relations to relate to human suffering. McKenzie states that early ACT started with a very strong focus on rule-governed behavior and that excessive rule following is what led to psychological suffering. But in grappling with the concept of rule-governed behavior itself, the role of derived relations in human suffering became increasingly apparent. This may be more salient with the concept of the transformation of functions that is central to RFT. Clinically, transformation of function may be used to understand how irrational fears develop and are maintained. Transformation of functions may be better understood by looking at the example McKenzie provides in the article. Take this early, relatively minor traumatic event. A boy goes horseback riding for the first time, and he falls off the horse, which leads to a fear of horses. The fear of horses could be considered to be directly conditioned. Let's say the boy spontaneously develops a fear of riding his bicycle, despite never having fallen off of his bicycle. Such a transfer of aversive or fear functions could be based on the fact that horses and bicycles are in a frame of equivalence or coordination in the context of things you ride. Over time, it is possible that the boy may avoid learning to ride a motorcycle or driving a car because these all enter into an equivalence frame of modes of transport that may lead to injury. The article goes on to explain that transformation of function can also be used to explain psychological suffering, such as the ability to relate entire relational networks to other relational networks, which may be involved in highly abstract transformation of functions. If we look at psychological suffering as derived relations and the derived transformation of functions, the role of language is critical. Transformation of functions helps us to see how the role of rules contributes to suffering. We are taught rules early on as a means to learn how to control our own behavior. Rules are taught to keep us from danger without ever having to come into direct contact with contingencies. ACT research suggests that rule-governed behavior may create behaviors that are insensitive to contingencies and may actually promote psychological suffering. ACT supports that excessive rule following can hinder daily life. Consider the implications of the following rules. Boys don't cry, I have to be strong, never let them see you sweat. Some of these rules may be helpful in certain aspects of your life, like your career, but can be damaging when it comes to personal relationships where vulnerability and intimacy are important features. The ACT model uses interventions to undermine excessive rule following, which can be done by identifying examples of rule following and what is referred to as the workability of the rule in various contexts. So we have discussed how rules are essentially networks of derived stimulus relations that are used with an act to understand and treat human psychological suffering. But now let's discuss how the study of derived relations has offered an RFT account of analogical reasoning and metaphor to act methodology. Stewart and Barnes Holmes, 2001, discussed how relating derived relations lies at the root of analogies and metaphors. Let's try this analogy. Peach is to pear as cat is to dog in which one coordination relation is related to another coordination relation. One coordination relation relates two stimuli in the context of fruit, and the other coordination relation relates the stimuli in the context of domestic animals. The phrase is to relates the two relations as coordinates with each other. Here is their explanation. The four stimuli do not collapse into a single relational network. 
in which all four elements become equivalent or coordinate, but rather the network consists of two separate relations that are related to each other as relation. They suggest that a key function of analogies and metaphors is to help listeners to use established knowledge in one domain to help understand an event or information in another domain. Struggling with anxiety is like struggling in quicksand. This example contains the relevant elements, two coordination relations, struggling with anxiety or a panic, and struggling in quicksand drowning. A coordination relation between these relations, struggling with anxiety is like struggling in quicksand, and seeing struggling as part of the problem. This analogy was designed so that the functions of struggling in quicksand transfer to struggling with anxiety through the coordination-coordination relation. In other words, the analogy suggests that there is something about struggling with anxiety that is similar to struggling in quicksand, mainly that the attempt to escape quicksand generally leads to drowning, just as struggling with anxiety can end in a full-blown panic attack. This type of analogy could be useful for someone who had not viewed their attempts to control their anxiety as something that may have been contributing to the likelihood of them, their anxiety ending in a panic attack. Understanding stimulus relations in this fashion may promote an individual to respond differently to anxiety in the future. In therapy, the use of relating relations occurs in the wider context of the therapist conducting a functional assessment of the client's situation such that a therapist needs to identify the client's key problems. For treatment, the closer an analogy matches the relevant relational networks for the client, the more likely it is that the appropriate behavioral change will occur for the client. The next phase of conceptual understanding looks at didactic stimulus relations and the verbal self. In 1974, Skinner stated that self-awareness is produced by social contingencies that reinforce the discrimination of one's own behavior. Simon and Barnes, 1997, expanded this definition by adding that out of this, the sense of self becomes abstracted. They noted that the emergence of a stable sense of self is a critical feature of human development and an assumed prerequisite for complex verbal behavior and psychological well-being. With RFT, the verbal self is comprised of three functionally distinct didactic relational units, the interpersonal IU relations, the spatial here-there relations, and the temporal now-then relations. Many researchers, including Barnes, Holmes, and colleagues, have argued that the verbal self, also known as di didactic I, appears to be central to psychological suffering. Those in the RFT camp support the notion that suffering is a byproduct of the verbal self engaging in excessive rule following. This is referred to as fusion in act and typically related to rules related to negative thoughts and feelings about the self. McKenzie Carr goes on to explain that these negative evaluations of the self as instances of excessive rule following by definition reduce the likelihood that behaviors will be emitted that could bring the individual in contact with reinforcement contingencies that would undermine the problematic rule following. An ACT approach to fusion or excessive rule following is to treat verbal rules simply as rules and that the verbal self is free to choose whether or not to abide by them. The goal of this is to not grapple with the rule, but to note that the verbal self is separate from the rules or relational networks. A hallmark of ACT is the use of metaphors or analogies to make this more salient. Mackenzie Carr offers the common act metaphor that suggests the verbal self is like a chessboard, where the black and white pieces represent negative and positive rules or evaluations about the self. Here, the board provides the context for the rules, but is separate from them. The goal of this metaphor is to undermine excessive rule following that may limit or reduce one's contact with potential reinforcers in the natural environment. The author goes on to discuss a new framework in RFT that emphasizes the potentially dynamic nature of derived relational responding and its implications for ACT. She suggested that the, this new development may help to reconnect RFT more directly with ACT, specifically the types of clinical phenomenon that arise in therapy. This framework is the multidimensional, multi-level framework, or MDML. The MDML framework consists of five levels of relational responding, mutual entailing, relational framing, relational networking, relating relations, and relating relational networks. The framework also conceptualizes each of these levels as having four dimensions, derivation, complexity, coherence, and flexibility. Each of these levels intersects with each dimension, which yields 20 units of analysis for conceptualizing the dynamics of relational responding. The author explains that derivation refers to how many times a derived response has been emitted, the first response is, by definition, high in derivation because it derived entirely from trained relations. Subsequent derived responses will gradually acquire their own history 
and therefore be less derived from the initially trained relations. Complexity is the detail or density of a pattern of relational responding. For instance, the number of relations or different types of relations in a given network. Coherence is the extent to which relational responding is predictable or consistent with previously established patterns of relational responding. Flexibility refers to the extent to which patterns of derived relational responding may be altered or affected by various contextual variables. For example, how readily a pattern of equivalence responding may change when the trained baseline relations are reversed. In summary, this article offers a brief tutorial on ACT from the RFT perspective on derived stimulus relations. The author notes that the relationship between ACT and RFT appeared to be relatively direct in the early years of both research programs. However, a drift between the two created challenges for seeing ACT's roots in the basic science concepts surrounding the study of derived stimulus relations. It is possible that through the MDML framework and other conceptual developments in RFT, we may strengthen the relationship between the two. These connections will help us as behavior analysts to further develop our skills for working with private events and covert verbal behavior.